Hello, welcome to worship via the internet at FBCO. Of course, we're worshiping this way until further notice in order to do our part to help stop the spread of the coronavirus. Now, by the way, today, Pastor Philip will be in the scripture a lot. And so if you have to hit pause occasionally to catch up and find the scripture and then hit play, you please go ahead and do that. And as a matter of fact, it'll help the whole family and help your children find those Bible verses and, and it'll, it'll be a better experience for everybody. So don't be afraid to do that. Well, so have you been listening to the TV lately? Have you read the newspaper? Have you scanned the internet for news? World health crisis, worst pandemic ever, world in chaos. The hysteria goes on and on. And we're not saying don't be aware of current events, certainly not. But those of us with a biblical worldview know Psalm 24. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and those who dwell therein. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the rivers. We also know Psalm 27. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? So with those things in mind, let's focus on the Lord God Almighty and give Him our wholehearted worship this morning. Come join us. When you go, I'll go. When you stay, I'll stay. When you move, I'll move. I will follow. with us together. All your ways are good, all your ways are sure. I will trust in you alone, higher than my sight, high above my life. I will trust in you alone. Where you go? Where you go, I'll go. Where you stay, I'll stay. When you move, I'll move. as we pray, please. Lord God, we just come into your presence today. We thank you that we're able to be together as a body of Christ today, even though not physically in this building. Uh, we are together. Make no mistake about that. And Lord, we pray that we would all come together in spirit and in truth and worship you, the one true God. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, as we prepare to study God's word today from John chapter 10, we've chosen music that will remind us of our good shepherd. And he cares for his sheep. We are his sheep. Make no mistake about that. 
He cares for his sheep perfectly. So let's worship him together today. This great old hymn, Savior Like a Shepherd, lead us.
good shepherd. We claim the promise from the prophet Isaiah. You will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you. Lord, prepare our hearts to receive your word today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I would invite you to take your copy of God's word and let's open it up to the gospel of John. And we will be reading out of John chapter 10. We'll be reading verses 1 through 6. The Bible says, Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in by another way, that man is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the gatekeeper opens. The sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. This figure of speech Jesus used with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. On my drive in to the church tonight, I pulled up to the end of Highway W and got ready to turn on to 14, and I was behind a car, and I looked up, and I had been contemplating the Lord is my shepherd, and I looked at the license plate, and the border around the license plate said, the Lord is. And so I'm not able to see as good as I used to could, so I was straining to see the Lord is my shepherd, and down below I found my shepherd. Now, I've never had that kind of thing happen to me ever when I was on the way to church to preach a sermon, and there the Lord reminds me that the Lord is my shepherd. It spoke to my heart. It encouraged me when you are contemplating what it means to have a good shepherd. And that is our subject today, Jesus, our good shepherd. This past Lord's Day, we introduced the biblical theme of Jesus as our good shepherd. We address the principles and the parallels that are certainly there present in the text between Jesus Christ, our good shepherd, and what we are supposed to be as under shepherds, overseers, uh, preachers of the word, pastors, and how we are supposed to shepherd the flock of God in relationship to how Jesus is our shepherd. Today, we're going to trace the Old Testament scriptures, and talk about the Lord as shepherd and connect it to chapters 9 and 10 in John's gospel. My prayer has been since we started John 10 that this text would serve as a catalyst that drives our hearts toward Christ when we think about Resurrection Sunday. I pray it will give us a deeper understanding and appreciation of Calvary And what the Lord Jesus accomplished for us there. The book of Hebrews. uh, Certainly uh, the shepherd motif captured the heart of the writer of Hebrews. Because he says this in his doxology about the shepherd. Now may the God of peace who brought up again from the dead our Lord Jesus. The great shepherd of the sheep by the blood of the eternal covenant. Equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. So we see him as the shepherd of Israel in the Old Testament, the good shepherd in John 10, and the great shepherd of the sheep in Hebrews chapter 13. Now, in tracing the shepherd imagery through the Bible, we learn that in the Pentateuch, in the first five books of the Bible, we learn how that the Lord revealed himself to Jacob as a shepherd. And he says to him, The true and living God 
has watched over you all the days of your life. So even in the first five books of the Bible, we have the principle of the shepherd and the guidance in Jacob's life. When you get to Exodus, we have the shepherding imagery and terminology of guiding and leading and protecting. And it's used over and over again. It's reflected uh, of the Lord God in his redemption of the children of Israel out of Egypt. This shepherding uh, understanding and terminology of leading the people of God. When you get to Numbers 27, we see an illusion uh, or a type, if you will, when Moses is getting ready to pass on, Moses asks, who will shepherd the people after I'm gone? And the answer is Joshua. Joshua's name in Greek means Jesus. In the Psalms, we have Yahweh as the shepherd and the people of the people as his flock. The Psalms are filled with this kind of language. If I polled all of you today, I'm sure that Psalm 23 would be at the top of your list of Psalms that you would consider your favorite. Or if I ask which Psalm are you most familiar with, most people are going to say Psalm 23. And in this Psalm, God reveals himself to his people as their shepherd. If you recall, the people of God will later end up in exile because of their own sin and disobedience to the Lord. And the northern and the southern kingdoms will end up in exile. The judgment for the northern first and then the southern kingdoms. And the judgment is represented by this analogy. Sheep that are scattered. This is the covenantal lawsuit ends up being that the Lord scatters his people in the northern and southern kingdoms. And again, that's one of the curses in Deuteronomy 24, is that the sheep would be scattered among the nations. After the exile, God begins to raise up prophets who reveal from the Lord God the terms of a shepherd, that the shepherd would come and gather back his people out of exile. So let me assist you in connecting the dots as we approach John 10 from the Old Testament prophets. The first one is found in the book of Ezekiel. If you will take your copy of the Word, and I hope that if you are watching uh, this Lord's Day morning, that you will certainly have your Bible in your hands, and you can take it and turn to Ezekiel chapter 34. All of these texts are so important for you to be able to trace how we get to John Chapter 10, Ezekiel 34, 11 through 16. The Bible says, For thus says the Lord God, Behold, I myself will search for my sheep, and I will seek them out. As a shepherd seeks out his flock when he is among his sheep that have been scattered, so will I seek out my sheep. And I will rescue them from all places where they have been scattered on a day of clouds and thick darkness. I will bring them out from the peoples and gather them from the countries and will bring them into their own land. And I will feed them on the mountains of Israel, by the ravines and in all the inhabited places of the country. I will feed them with good pasture. And on the mountain heights of Israel shall be their grazing land. There they shall lie down in good grazing land. And on rich pasture they shall feed on the mountains of Israel. I myself will be the shepherd of my sheep. I myself will make them lie down, declares the Lord God. I will seek the lost, and I will bring back the strayed, and I will bind up the injured, and I will strengthen the weak, and the fat and the strong I will destroy. I will feed them in justice. Let your eyes move over a little bit to the end of chapter 34. And the Bible will remind us, beginning in verse 23 of Ezekiel 34, And I will set up over them one shepherd, my servant David, and he shall feed them. He shall feed them and be their shepherd. And I, the Lord, will be their God, and my servant David shall be prince among them. I am the Lord, and I have spoken." Now, this prophecy will have a partial fulfillment when the exiles return to the land under Zerubbabel. 
We know this from the Word of God. Yet, the trajectory of the fulfillment of the prophecy does not end uh, in the post-exilic age. It actually has a trajectory forward. So the goal of the regathering of the sheep is not complete. Ezekiel 34 speaks of the Lord God gathering his people. It speaks of a shepherd that God will raise up. Now, again, the shepherd is identified as David. The question, is David going to be resurrected from the grave? David's dead and off the scene. Who are we actually speaking of? If you know anything about the Old Testament, then you know that David, David was a type of a king to come. David was a type of a future king who would establish an eternal kingdom. In 2 Samuel, we have this covenantal promise made to David. I hope you will remember this. One of David's descendants would sit on his throne forever and ever. And when you get to Matthew's genealogy, it reveals to us the genealogy of the king, the Lord Jesus Christ. And we are told in Matthew 1 that Jesus is the son of David. So when the Son of God, the Lord Jesus, uh, comes to this world in his first advent, he is coming to gather his sheep. He's coming to gather his sheep unto himself. And in the great commission that he gives to us after his life, death, burial, and resurrection, and just before he ascends into heaven, he gives us a great commission. And that commission is about the gathering of his people. Turn over to Ezekiel 37. I hope you stayed there. Just mark uh, John 9 and 10. We're going to go to those in a moment. But Ezekiel 37, 24 through 26. I'm sorry, 37, 24 through 26. My servant David shall be king over them, and they shall all have one shepherd. They shall walk in my rules and be careful to obey my statutes. They shall dwell in the land that I gave to my servant Jacob with where your fathers live. They and their children and their children's children shall dwell there forever. And David my servant shall be their prince forever. Turn over to Micah. Micah chapter 2. We're going to get to John 10 eventually. We're connecting to the dots of the Good Shepherd. Micah 2, 12 through 13. I will surely assemble all of you, O Jacob. I will gather the remnant of Israel. I will set them together like a sheep in a fold, like a flock in its pasture. A noisy multitude of men. Verse 13. He who opens the breach goes up before them. They break through and pass the gate going out by it. Their king passes on before them. The Lord at their head. Here we see the shepherd king going out before his people, the sheep. Now let's turn over to John chapter 10. Keep in mind, uh, when we read the Old Testament and we come over to Christ and Him speaking, we got to remember that Jesus taught from the rich background of the Old Testament. When He taught, He stood there as the very fulfillment of the Old Testament. The Old Testament was the shadow and Jesus Christ was the substance. The Old Testament was the promise and Jesus Christ was the fulfillment. He is the fulfillment of all that was written in the Old Testament. So when you get to chapter 10 of John, we have to ask the question, what precipitated what Jesus had to say in John 10? Why did he begin to speak regarding him being the good shepherd? Well, it's because John 9 serves as the springboard for Jesus to declare that he is the good shepherd. But also to make pointed allusions to the Pharisees whom Jesus would identify as thieves 
and robbers. That's the dual thing going on here. So what is chapter 9 of the Gospel of John? If you know your Bible, it is singularly around the healing of a man born blind. Listen to John 10, 19. It refers back to it. There was again a division among the Jews because of these words. Many of them said of concerning Jesus, He has a demon, demon, and he is insane. Why listen to him? Others said, These are not the words of one who is oppressed by a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? So you can see that what happens in John 9 is being used by Christ as a springboard to teach that he is the good shepherd. So in 9.13, let's set our context. The Bible reminds us, John 9.13, they brought to the Pharisees the man who had formerly been blind. Now it was a Sabbath day when Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes. So the Pharisees again asked him how he had received his sight, and he said to them, He put mud on my eyes and washed, and I see. Some of the Pharisees said, This man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others said, How can a man who is a sinner do such things, do such signs? And there was a division among them. So they said again to the blind man, What do you say about him since he has opened your eyes? He said, He is a prophet. The Jews said, did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they called the parents of the man who had received his sight and asked them, Is this your son, who you say was born blind? How then does he now see? His parents answered, We know that this is our son and that he was born blind, but how he now sees we do not know, nor do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him. He is of age. He will speak for himself." His parents said these things because they feared the Jews, for the Jews had already agreed that if anyone should confess Jesus to be the Christ, he was to be put out of the synagogue. Therefore, his parents said, he is of age, ask him. So in John 9, 13 and following, we see the Pharisees themselves fulfilling what the prophet said. What are they doing? They're mistreating the sheep with contempt. Contempt. They should have been rejoicing over an incredible miracle of someone born blind that has never been able to see, and yet they're mistreating the sheep. They're seen here in the text badgering this man and his parents. They're certainly not giving the guidance that a true shepherd would give. So we may call them the bad shepherds, and they always mistreat the sheep. So the mistreating, check out the other point. In the next section, we see the bad shepherds putting them out, putting the sheep out. So for the second time, they called the man who had been blind and said to him, Give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. He answered, Whether he is a sinner, I do not know. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. They said to him, What did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered them, I've told you already, and you would not listen. He's kind of getting a little agitated, isn't he? Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? And they reviled him, saying, you are his disciple. But we are disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we do not know where he comes from. The man answered, why? This is an amazing thing. You do not know where he comes from, and yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners, but if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, God listens to him. Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. They answered him, you were born in utter sin, and you would teach us, and they cast him out. So in this text, I hope you understand that there's more to the story than just the healing of the man born blind. In actuality, this is prophetic fulfillment. And John is focusing on the false shepherds who are mistreating the sheep. He's focusing on the false shepherds who are putting the sheep out of the synagogue. So this is the significance 
uh, because, again, the bad shepherds were prophesied in the Old Testament. The good shepherd, the Lord Jesus Christ, would come and replace the bad shepherds. Look with me in Jeremiah 23, 1 through 4. Jeremiah 23, 1 through 4. Woe to the shepherds who destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture. Declares the Lord. Therefore, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, concerning the shepherds who care for my people, you have scattered my flock and have driven them away, and you have not attended to them. Behold, I will attend to you for your evil deeds, declares the Lord. And again, over in Ezekiel 34, we didn't read this earlier, we were in the same chapter, but notice how this chapter begins. Chapter 34, verse 1. The word of the Lord came to me, son of man. Prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, even to the shepherds, thus says the Lord God, Ah, shepherds of Israel, who have been feeding yourselves, should not shepherds feed the sheep? You ate, you eat the fat, you clothe yourselves with wool, you slaughter the fat ones, but you do not feed the sheep. The weak you have not strengthened, the sick you have not healed, the injured you have not bound up, the strayed. You have not brought back the lost you have not sought, and with force and harshness you have ruled them, so they were scattered, because there was no shepherd, and they became food for all the wild beasts. My sheep were scattered, they wandered over all the mountains and on every high hill. My sheep were scattered over all the face of the earth, with none to search or seek them. But when you get to John chapter 10, you see clearly that the Lord Jesus Christ is using this as a springboard uh, to give the ultimate, uh, one of the ultimate I am statements. I am the good shepherd. Note verse 1 of John 10. We finally made it to John chapter 10. What I want you to see in the first six verses is the fact that the good shepherd gathers his sheep where the robbers and the thieves mistreat and put the sheep out here is the true shepherd who comes to gather his sheep the bible says truly truly i say to you he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door but climbs in by another way that man is a thief and a robber the old testament had prophesied the thieves and the robbers do you know that the door to the courtyard of the sheep is a picture of a legitimate way of authorized access to the sheep. The only legitimate way to collect sheep is through the gate. Jesus begins this section with a double amen or double truly, truly it is said. So the thief and the robber were not authorized to minister to the flock of Israel. They were not shepherds because they were not commissioned. There was an interest, but it was only in brutalizing the sheep and stealing the sheep, they sought to maximize, as the Old Testament says, their own own benefits at the expense of the sheep. So what an awesome, marvelous transition that Jesus gives us by warning us that there are thieves and there are robbers. In verse 2, Jesus begins to describe the marks of a true shepherd. And the Bible says the true shepherd enters in by the door. The true shepherd enters in through the Lord God. Why? Because the Lord God has given him authorization. He is the one who is truly commissioned. He is the one that is truly called. So when you continue reading in Jeremiah 23, I'm going to turn there quickly for you. You'll notice this. Jeremiah 23 In verse 3, the Bible says, Behold, I will attend to you for, uh, verse 3, Then I will gather the remnant of my flock out of all the countries where I have driven them, and I will bring them back to their fold, and they shall be fruitful and multiply. I will set shepherds over them who will care for them, and they shall fear no more, nor be dismayed, neither shall be any missing, any be missing, declares the Lord. And listen to this. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch. And he shall reign as king and deal wisely 
and shall execute justice and righteousness in the lands in the land in his days Judah will be saved and Israel will be will dwell securely and this is the name by which he will be called the Lord is our righteousness so here Jesus begins to tell us that he himself is the good shepherd and as they sought to maximize all of their own benefits that's not true of the marks of the true shepherd here after warning about the thieves Jeremiah does the same thing right he warns about the thieves and then he talks about the righteous branch and here Jesus does the same thing warns of the thieves makes that transition to the marks of the true shepherd in verse 3 to him the gatekeeper opens the sheep hear his voice and he calls his own sheep and don't you love this terminology by name and leads them out the gatekeeper opens the door for the true shepherd because the gatekeeper perhaps a reference to the father gives access to the true shepherd there is an absolute nature to this Uh, the access is given to the true shepherd who is appointed by God now at this point the Bible says the sheep hear his voice he calls his sheep by name, and he leads them out. Think about the imagery of the true shepherd walking into the courtyard, and he calls each sheep by name. The true sheep respond to the voice of the shepherd. This is what theologians have often called the effectual call. In Isaiah chapter 2, verse 3, it reminds us that the days will come to pass in latter days, when the people themselves will literally be taught by God. Isn't that an awesome understanding? That the people will be taught by God. Did you know that Jesus himself will use that same text out of Isaiah 2, that they will be taught by God to speak concerning himself? Here it is, John chapter 6, verse 44. John 6, 44. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. And I will raise him up on the last day. Now check this out. It is written, it is written in the prophets, and they will all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. That's the mark of a true shepherd, an effectual call. The shepherd calls the sheep. Don't you find it fascinating that he calls the sheep by name? And we know that in ancient Near East customs, there was the practice of Israelite shepherds, and they gave their sheep names. They would call those sheep by their name as they brought them into the sheepfold at night. What an awesome picture. Here, the Lord Jesus Christ tells us that he calls And the sheep hear his voice, and he calls each of them by name. Now, we all recognize there's a big difference between Don Currents saying to us in church, Attention, please! When Don does that, we just kind (laughs) of keep doing what we were doing for a little while. And, and you know, we kind of give a casual look over and think about that. But what if Don actually calls us by name? Uh, The fact of the matter is, if you say attention, everyone, I'm not going to give you full attention immediately, usually. But if you call me by my name, Philip, I'm going to turn immediately. Just think of the significance that the shepherd knows his sheep by name. And he calls his sheep by name. It's in the calling of the sheep by name that the sheep hear the voice of the shepherd. And the Bible says that they follow him. Jesus came and his sheep responded the response is very simple is it not they hear and they follow that's pretty simple theology isn't it when the lord god calls his sheep by name they hear and their response is they hear him and respond and you can rest assured this is what we believe at this church that through the proclamation of the gospel of the lord jesus christ people will hear and they will respond when Jesus calls them by name. Jesus identifies this as a true mark 
that the sheep hear his voice. He is a personal shepherd. Do you know that he knows all your strengths? And in my case, he knows all my weaknesses. He knows it for all of us. He knows if you're a little bit older and you move a little slower. He knows if you are much younger and you're prone to wander away. He knows when you need rest and he knows when you need to eat. He knows absolutely everything about his sheep. Notice next, the Bible says not only does he call you by name, but he leads you out. He doesn't drive them out. He doesn't pound on them to get them to do what he wants them to do. He leads them out. Again, this brings us back to the passage in Micah. You probably didn't understand what you were reading until you think about the imagery. But listen to this again. He who opens the breach, he's a breach breaker. The one who opens the breach goes before them, none other than the Son of God. They break through and pass the gate, going out by it, and their king passes on before him. The Lord at their head. What an awesome picture of the Lord leading his people. He puts forth his own and goes ahead of them, and they follow him. The breaking one comes forth, breaks through the line, and as he breaks through the line, the sheep, the true sheep of Israel, follow the one who is broken forth. As their shepherd king. If you are a sheep, there was a time when uh, you heard the voice of the shepherd and you know, knew that you heard him. You knew that there was a time, you know there was a time when you were in absolute darkness and then you were in absolute glorious light. That's because you were called and led by the shepherd. There was a time when you were dead and then you were alive. There was a time when you were sinking in trespasses and sins, and then you realize that you've been laid hold of by someone far greater than you are. This is the shepherd gathering his people. In verses 4 through 6, we not only see before the marks of the true shepherd, but then we begin to see the marks of the true sheep. Notice the text. When he has brought out all his own, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. Stranger, they will not follow, but they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. And again, this figure of speech Jesus used with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. Sheep will follow because they know the master's voice. They will not follow a stranger. That is the thieves and the robbers. We have to wonder today when so many people abandon the faith, Uh, So many people claim to know Christ and that he is their shepherd, and yet it doesn't take anything at all to get them out of kilter, to get them wandering off away from the shepherd. Well, the true mark of of sheep and true sheep is that they follow their shepherd, the Lord Jesus Christ. Are there implications for us in this? You better believe it. True sheep will not follow strangers. True sheep will follow their shepherd. In verse 6, there's this lack of understanding that John notes. His opponents do not understand what he is saying. Uh, We That kind of baffles our minds, right? The Lord incarnate, God Almighty, standing before them, in total fulfillment of everything I've read in the Old Testament, and yet the religious elite and leaders do not know what he is saying. Is there a reason for that? Glad you asked, right? John 10, verse 25. Jesus answered them, I told you and you do not believe. Just straight out disbelief. The works that I do in my Father's name bear witness about me. But you do not believe because you are not among my sheep. Can't get any clearer. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me and I give to them eternal life and they will never perish And no one will ever snatch them out of my hands. Those are marks of the true sheep that belong to the Lord. When they did begin to grasp a little later exactly what he was telling them after he gives explanation after explanation, they understand, well, he's pointing the finger absolutely at us. It served only as a basis for rejecting the Son of God. Now I want to remind you that there are only two kinds of people that are at home today listening to this sermon those who have heard the voice of the shepherd 
and are in the mode of following, and there are those who do not understand. There are the sheep who know the voice of the shepherd, and they are following, and then there are those who do not understand. Today, if you do not understand, if you are not a sheep, there's one thing for you to do. You need to cry out to the good shepherd so that you might have your eyes opened to the glorious gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ like the man born blind in John chapter 9. Again, I'm sure that verse 25 plays on your heartstrings. Listen to it again. He answered, whether he is a sinner I do not know. One thing I do know that though I was blind, now I see. Did you know that from our perspective, when we really think about sheep, it's not a huge compliment. I hate to burst your bubble because we we think about the great shepherd of the sheep, and it is such a blessing to look up and see uh, outlined on a license plate, the Lord is my shepherd. And we think about being sheep, but sheep are not known for their intelligence. They're really not. We need a shepherd because we're dull and we're defenseless. We'll wander off a cliff and into a gully in a moment. We have no natural means to defend ourselves. The image should do away with any rampant self-exaltation. And salvation must not first be about you, but about the great shepherd of the sheep who actually saved sinners. And I want to remind you that we are desperately in need of a shepherd. When I was growing up, I mentioned to some of the ladies in the praise band, one of my favorite songs was Shepherd of My Heart by Sandy Patty. I was going through, I was 18, 19 years of age, listening to that song, and the Lord had called me to preach when I was 17, and I really needed the shepherd of my heart, making decisions, and getting married, and moving into the ministry, and uh, some of those words. Just listen to this, maker of this heart of mine, you know me very well. You understand my deepest thoughts more than I know myself. That's the shepherd, isn't it? So when I face the darkness, when I need to find my way, I trust in you, shepherd of my heart. A little later on, the song says, So if I start to wonder, like a lamb that's gone astray, I'll trust in you, shepherd of my heart. And then a couple of others. I can rest within your arms. I can know your loving ways. You know, it's, it's foreign to say to someone that's not a sheep, that doesn't have Christ as the shepherd, that we can know his ways. But what an awesome privilege uh, to be a sheep and to have Jesus Christ as our shepherd. Let's pray together. Great God, we thank you for revealed truth. Lord, how that we can look into the Old Testament Lord, it's inspired every jot and tittle, every aspect of your word in the old and the new. And Lord, just the fact, just the continuity of of the truth of your word and how awesome you were, Lord, to give all of these images, uh, the, the metaphor of a shepherd and sheep. And Lord, for you, Lord Jesus, to be obedient to the Father's will coming down to this earth to gather your sheep, to purchase us by paying a price. Lord, in the coming weeks, we're going to talk about that you would lay down your life for the sheep. And not only did you lay down your life for the sheep, but it reminds us in John 10 that you had the power to take it up again. You laid down your life, you had the power to take it up, which is speaking of your glorious resurrection. For all the ones that are hearing this very day, this sermon, we pray, Father, that it fell upon ears and hearts and minds that were receptive to hear your truth. And Lord, there is nothing greater in life than to have our great shepherd, the Lord Jesus Christ, who bought us with his own blood and made us sheep of his pasture. Thank you, Father, for that. We pray for Christians today that are hearing, not just lost people who need to trust you, but Christians, Lord, may we trust you when we lose our way, when we wander, Lord, like a lamb uh, that goes off on their own. Lord, we're prone to wonder. We feel it. God, may we trust our shepherd. May we always sense 
your rod and your staff leading us. The Lord is our shepherd and we shall not want. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.